were here, and also uh, we have uh, something else where some of you were here. Uh, we have Dr. James Rimel and Emily Cockburn are going to favor us this morning, this evening. You don't know how many people I said good morning to at the Christmas Eve service last time. So, you know, it's one of those things. One of those church things. So I'd like to welcome those two up. Um, they're going to uh, play a selection for us, and I'll leave it to them for the introduction.
take this place. Welcome to the well. What a joy it is to have you here with us tonight. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Seems like just yesterday I was panicked about making sure the Christmas tree found its way into just the right spot in the living room, perfectly centered between the two windows that the star was on top just right, and every light was working with the tinsel hanging evenly. And now, the day has passed. Did you notice the little detail on the slide titled, Twas the Night After Christmas? Where's the Christmas tree now? already sitting in a trash can on the front curb. 
Let's take a look at this next slide and you can tell me if this hits home for you. A thing of beauty one minute, admired, hampered, and then the next minute, brushed, as brushed aside and abandoned. Seems mildly humorous unless we look at it in this light. And just in case you can't quite make out that image, it's the image of Christ lying in a manger surrounded by animals. It seems like the hype of Christmas can build to an apex and there's so much anxiety and, and hurry, hurry, hurry about the Christmas season that when it's finally over, we want to take a deep breath and then brush it all aside really quick. The aftermath of Christmas. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing. Keeps me singing as I go. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. I'd like us to spend some time together tonight talking about the precious name of Jesus. And what I would like for us to see is that the character of God is revealed not only in the miracles of Jesus, not only in the words of of Jesus, not only in the deeds and the actions of Jesus, but also in the very name of Jesus. In the very name that God chose to give His Son is revealed some very intimate characteristics of our Father in heaven. Max Lucado wrote in one of his books that God could have named Jesus the great reverend holiness angelic divinity the third. And everyone would have been intimidated. But instead, God named his son Jesus. And believe it or not, contrary to popular belief, the name Jesus was actually quite common during this time of our history. In fact, it would be like naming someone Bob today. But it's in the very commonality of the name of Jesus that we begin to uncover the very first characteristic. And, and before we go there, let's pause. Then. Before we look at that first characteristic, let's pause and ask God's blessing upon this part of our time together. <laughs> Our Father in Heaven, we're so grateful for the Christmas season, the season of Advent that is filled with so much anticipation and hope and expectation. Father, we ask that you would remind us tonight that just because the day, the 25th, has come and gone does not mean the miracle of Christmas is to be brushed aside and forgotten. Remind us tonight of the continuing miracle of of Christmas and how that should impact our lives today. Thank you, Father. Please keep me out of your way tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The first characteristic in his name we find is the approachability of Jesus. The approachability of Jesus. Have you ever noticed as you read through the entirety of the Gospels, nowhere do you find anyone who was afraid to approach Jesus out of fear of rejection? No one. No one ever demonstrated fear to approach Jesus out of fear that he would send them away. Now, disciples tried to get people to, to not approach Jesus for fear they would be rejected. But that's why they were the disciples, right? <laughs> 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 
Jesus was approaching. But we know there's a second name used for Jesus. When the angel said this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name, say it with me, Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So Emmanuel was a descriptive name given to Jesus because he was literally God with us. Which clearly indicates the proximity of Jesus. God is with us. So quickly, the commonness of his name suggests the approachability. And the name Emmanuel suggests his proximity. Make sense? So this is what I want us to see. As great a miracle as Christmas was, as amazing as it was, when Jesus left his throne in heaven and became one of us, as great a miracle as it was for the creator of all the universe to enter into his creation, as great a miracle as it was for the author of history to step into his story. As great a miracle as that was, there is still a continuing miracle of Christmas. A continuing miracle. An ongoing miracle that we call Christmas. And the continuing miracle of Christmas is this. Jesus is still... Emmanuel. He is still God with us. He still has proximity. He still has approachability. In fact, the last words Jesus spoke before ascending to his Father in heaven was what? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I had a, an, an Old Testament professor whose last name, ironically enough, was Lo, L O. He thought that verse was written for him. Lo, I'm with you always. <laughs> Other people thought that was a verse that justified not flying in airplanes. Lo, I'm with you always. Not if you... No. I'm with you always. So when your heart cracks because the person said no and walked out the door, I'm with you always. When the interviewer says, we've already filled that position, thanks for coming anyway. I'm with you always. When that person that you've shared the majority of your life with decides they no longer want to share the rest of their life with you, he is still Emmanuel. God with you. Jesus says, I am near you. I am always near you. I am always with you. I may have shared this with you once before, but I just so vividly remember being in church as a teenager. And of course, we sat, a group of about 10 of us teenagers took up the back row. I figured what our parents couldn't see, the better. And I just remember the pastor, as one of his illustrations, he had us stop. And he said, I want you to, to imagine right now, imagine that you hear the back door of the sanctuary open. And remember, we're in the back. The teens are in the back. So the door was to my, just over my left shoulder was the door. And he said, I want you to imagine that you hear the door to the sanctuary open. And as you casually turn to see who has walked in, it's Jesus himself. Jesus comes through the door of our church, pauses just long enough to scan the crowd and find you. And he locks eyes with you. And he smiles. And he quietly makes his way down the pew, sits down next to you, puts his hand on your shoulder. And Jesus just looks at you, waiting for you to speak. 
And the pastor said, what would you say? <coughs> what would you say to Jesus if he were here tonight? What would you ask him? And as a teen, I was, I was overwhelmed with this. I thought, man, I'd tell him I love him. I'd tell him, thank you for dying for my sins. I'd tell him, thank you for saving me. I'd ask him, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? Am I ever going to meet that special someone? I mean, what's the first thing you would say? What's the first thing you would ask? And as my mind was spinning around all of these possibilities, the pastor caught me off guard when he said, well, Jesus is here. He is here right now. So whatever it is that you were going to ask him, whatever it is that you were going to tell him, do it now. And it took my breath away. I thought, of course, of course he's here. He's present, he's aware, he's listening. He knows what's going on. He, he feels what I feel. The spirit of Jesus is with me when I'm in church. He's with me at home. He's with me at work. And oh God, he's with me when I'm driving my car even. He's with me everywhere. But as basic and a fundamental fact as that is, it's one that so often slips from our minds, isn't it? We don't always actively live our lives as if Jesus himself were standing right beside us, hand on our shoulder, on every moment of every day. Imagine carrying a life-sized cardboard cutout of Jesus with you everywhere you went. Sometimes I think that might be helpful for me. Because <laughs> I can picture the big giant cardboard cutout of Jesus standing in the kitchen when I begin to contemplate what to say about my wife's dinner or not to say. Right? My wife's a great cook. I don't mean... But when you imagine a big cardboard cutout of Jesus standing next to you at the water cooler at the office, and the stories begin, hmm. Jesus, actively present in our lives on a moment-by-moment, -moment, second by second basis, watching, listening waiting for us to acknowledge his presence. It's important for us to remember he is still Emmanuel, God with us today, December 29, 2013. So, I hadn't planned on saying most of that, aren't you glad? <clears throat> 42 minutes and we'll be done. What I really want us to focus on for the remainder of our time together is this, this idea of the continuing miracle of Christmas and the implications that come and arise out of that. The first one is this. Every time we stumble, God knows it. And that's sobering. Every time we stumble, God knows it. And that is sobering. Every time we stumble, stumble morally, ethically, physically, relationally, intellectually, God knows it. <laughs> and I was reminded of this. I was reading one of my favorite books. It's, it's a book It's only about that big and about that thick. The title of the book gives it away right away. The title of the book is America's Least Competent Criminals. Somebody gave that to me when I was still a cop. I still have it to this day. And it's just full of true stories of how dumb criminals can be. For example, in 1984, four um, teenagers went to a mall in Florida and decided that they were going to steal a vehicle that day. And they walked around the, the mall parking lot for a while, finally decided on this nice big white van with no side windows after a lot of hard work at prying the back door open, they finally got the back door open and came face to face with four undercover cops. 
who were parked in the mall on surveillance duty, specifically to find out who was stealing cars from the mall parking lot. <laughs> then there's a 25-year-old man who was arrested under suspicion of breaking into vending machines and stealing all the coins and money out of the vending machines. And at first, they didn't have a lot of, of evidence to go on. And so the judge set his bail at $400, at which time he promptly reached into his backpack and pulled out $400 in quarters. <laughs> Suddenly the prosecution's, the prosecution, that's hard, prosecution's case got a lot stronger, didn't it? Now, I was reading these stories, and their stories, and their stories, I'm thinking, my goodness, you have got to be really dumb to be a thief. Don't they know eventually they're going to get caught? How dumb? And then it hit me. How often do you and I fool ourselves into thinking that we're getting away with something? We're like Moses, who wanted to kill one of the Egyptian slave masters. And Exodus 2.20 says, he looked this way, he looked that way, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian. That's what it says. He looked this way, he looked that way, he thought he was getting away with it. The problem is, he looked this way, he looked this way, he forgot to look up. And isn't that what we do? We tell a lie. And we say to ourselves, oh, nobody will ever know the difference. We break a promise to our spouse, and we think, oh, I covered my tracks really good. She's never going to find out. We spread a little gossip or a little slander, and we convince ourselves, nobody will ever trace that back to me. I'm too good for that. The truth is, we never really get away with anything, do we? Every time we stumble, even if others don't catch us, even if we think we've committed the perfect crime, so to speak, even if we're convinced we've covered our tracks beautifully, God knows. God knows. Hebrews 4, verse 13. Nothing, nothing, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Just think about that for a minute. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom, to whom we must give account. Now, we may know that's true with our brains, but what's sobering is to begin to live our lives day in and day out with that realization right I mean, just mentally let your guard down for a moment and reflect back over your last week or your last month at the number of times that you've stumbled, even a little bit, but, but you've convinced yourself that you've gotten away with it. You've convinced yourself, and nobody knows. So what's the answer? What's the solution? Well, since the sickness... <coughs> is sin, and since it's kind of a sickness, we, can't, we need kind of a prescription. So I think Jesus would offer a two-word prescription. Fess up. Fess up. Just be honest with God. Just come clean. Because the truth is, the longer that we wait to fess up, the more strain it puts on our relationship with Him. And this becomes crystal clear when you think about a parental relationship with teenagers. For example, let's pretend you're a parent and you have a teenage boy 
and you have decided, or you have discovered that your teenage son has attended a party that you expressly forbade him to go. You told him you will not go to that party, and he is gone. But he does not know that you know. Okay? So he comes home at the end of his night out, and you ask him, So, where'd you go tonight, son? Uh, yeah, bowling. <laughs> oh, really? Well, how'd you do? And he says, I, uh, pretty good. You were gone an awful long time for bowling. Well, you know, we had to um, a lot of we uh, wait. We had to wait for a lane. Yeah, yeah, that's the ticket. And what does all this cover-up do to your relationship with your child? Every cover-up adds more tension and more friction. And in the end, <coughs> you're probably going to be way more upset about the cover-up and his refusal to fess up than you were about the fact that he went to the party in the first place, right? Don't you just want him to come clean, look you in the eye, and say, Dad... Mom, I did something that you told me not to do, and I'm really sorry. And it's the same when it comes to our relationship with our Father in Heaven. So often, we want to cover up instead of fess up. And our refusal to fess up adds tension and stress to our relationship with the one person that we shouldn't have any tension and stress in that relationship with. Proverbs 28, 13 kind of gives us a window into this reality. It says this, He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, which is ironic because that's exactly what the person concealing their sins is hoping to do, right? That's why you conceal your sin. You're hoping somehow you'll prosper from covering up your sin. Now, the second half of that verse says, whoever confesses and renounces, and for some reason I was captivated by that word renounces, and so I looked it up, and the dictionary defines renounces as this. Someone who formally announces one's abandonment of something. Formally announce one's abandonment of. So in this context, he who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and formally announces one of one's abandonment of his sins finds mercy. Why is it that so often we have to be nailed to the wall, handcuffs pending, death facing us in the eye before we'll actually realize how desperate we are for mercy, mercy, mercy. Friends, when we stumble, all God want, wants us to say is, God, I know I did something that you didn't want me to do. And God, I am so sorry. And I renounce that and I turn from it. And I don't ever want to do that again because I don't want there to be any tension in my relationship with you. Because I know that when I'm honest with you, you're always merciful in return. So whenever we stumble, God knows it. And that's sober. But we find compassion when we fess up, we meet compassion when we offer confession. The second implication is this. Every time we struggle, God feels it. And that's encouraging. Because you see, God, it, Jesus isn't just God with us in the sense that he has proximity to us. He is also God with us in the sense that he actually became one of us. 
on Christmas Day. Remember the story of the chinchilla, right? <laughs> and how if we could become a chinchilla, we could communicate with the chinchilla why the new cage is so much better than the old. And how that's what God did for us. He became one of us to effectively communicate his love for us. To effectively communicate the character of God to us. He is God with us in the sense that we're knit together by this common experience of walking this common ground that we call earth. The continuing miracle of Jesus. That's what Jesus did on Christmas morning. He became man. And he lived among us. And we can look at that and we can know that because he walked this earth and he breathed the same air that we breathe, he can relate with us. That's what Christmas is all about. That's the real aftermath of Christmas. We hear the term aftermath and we picture the chaos of our living room come December 26th. But the real chaos, or the real aftermath of Christmas is all the, these things that result from the birth of our Savior. All the mercy and grace and forgiveness that's available to us because of that first Christmas morning. Because Jesus walked the earth, we can be confident even today that he will have special understanding and empathy with us when we bring him our struggles. Hebrews 4, verse 15. <coughs> For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And then listen to the next verse, verse 16. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Isn't that beautiful? Draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. How beautiful. Draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's exactly what a woman did who sent me a Christmas card one year. And in this Christmas card, she told me how her husband of over 30 years packed up, walked out, and left her and their four children behind. And it was a terrible, horrible blow to her as it would have been to anyone. But she wrote in this card, do you know what saved me? In big, bold letters in the card she wrote, my husband walked out, but Jesus walked in. My husband walked out, but Jesus walked in. She found that God is a God who understands her pain and her frustration and her anxiety and that deep, hollow, empty feeling that you have sometimes when life lets you down that you can't even articulate into words because the pain is so deep. God understands even that. And she had learned that. And she had learned to lean on Him during these times. And, and she learned to lean on her church. And you know what she said about her church? They have proven faithful. Isn't that beautiful? She leaned on God and she leaned on God's people and they both have proven faithful. And so what should we do? <clears throat> Human nature is to cover up, right? To refuse to acknowledge it. But again, I think Jesus would offer a two-word prescription. I think he would say, don't cover up, but open up. Open up, as that verse said. Draw near with confidence that you will find grace and mercy when you need it. Draw near to God. Draw near to your church family. 
your brothers and sisters, because they are the hands and feet that Jesus will use to help heal your wounds. 1 Peter 5 says, cast all your cares on him, for he cares about you. Cast all your cares on him. Not just the big ones. All <coughs> your cares. There's a freedom in that because you don't have to weigh and balance which needs you can and cannot bring to him. Which are important enough to bring to him and which are not. Which do I need to handle on my own and which are okay to bring to an almighty God. God says, bring them all. Let me sort them out. Every time you struggle, God feels it. And that should be encouraging. The third and final implication of a continuing miracle of Christmas is this. Every time we sacrifice, every time we sacrifice for Him, God honors it. And that is motivating. In other words, whenever it costs you something to follow Jesus, he knows it, and he promises to pay you back tenfold. Every time you jeopardize your reputation or your career by standing up for your faith in Jesus Christ, every time you swallow your pride and, and don't lash back at someone that your male ego really wants to, every time you're in a hurry but you pause for that random act of kindness anyway. Every time you're really, really tired, but you take time out of your day to serve others anyway. Every time you make these kinds of sacrifices and you're convinced that no one else notices, just like God notices the other things, God notices this. God notices. God cares. And God rewards you not only with that inner sense of accomplishment that you get during those times, but He promises that he will reward you in heaven as well. Proverbs 11, verse 18. He who sows righteousness is a fool and will be taken advantage of repetitively. Hmm. He who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. What we, what we refer to as the law of sowing and reaping, right? Now, our earthly problem is we want to see the reaping of others because they sowed evil against us and we're waiting to watch their reaping of evil, right? But that's not the way it works. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that we're to keep our eyes and watch for others to be judged. And yet time and time again, Scripture says what we're supposed to do. <clears throat> and some people I know wish with all their heart they made Bibles in the shape of a hammer. <laughs> right? Because that's what they do. They go around and they thump people in the head with their Bible. God's Word says you're supposed to be doing this and you're not doing it. God's Word says you're supposed to be doing this and you're not doing it. And they forget that the commands in God's Word were not intended for those outside the kingdom of God. The commands in the Bible were given to people who were already in a relationship with God. So for believers to take the commandments that were made for believers and try to drop them on the heads of unbelievers is why unbelievers don't want to be believers. He who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. In other words, God's watching. And God will reward you. And I think God would offer us this time a three-word prescription to those of you who are so faithful. I think he would say, keep it up. Keep it up. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Never give up. Never give up. Never, never, never give up. Just imagine Jesus standing over your shoulder, cheering you on, shouting, you just wait. You just wait, my child, until the day of your reward comes. 
You just wait for that day when you're standing in the holy courtroom before my Father in heaven. And I get to lean in and I get to say, Judge, this is my friend Jeff. The perfect one. And I know what you're thinking. I've heard you preach, brother. You're not perfect. <laughs> I've heard you speak with your children. You're not perfect. But this is the amazing thing. When we get into that courtroom in heaven, it's as if God himself is the judge and his son Jesus is our attorney. And so when we, when you stand in that room, your attorney, the judge's son, is going to lean in say, Father, my blood has atoned for everything. He's with me. Now let's open the doors of let him in. And if you've lived a life even remotely close to mine, that is some of the most humbling theology you will ever hear. To know that despite all the things that you have done, to know that even the things that you've done that you've forgotten about, that he will know about, will be wiped away. And your sins will be buried in the deepest of deep seas, separated from you as far as the east is from the west. You will be washed white as snow, forgiven and made clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. If that doesn't make you want to dance, I don't know what will. If that doesn't get your fire burning, your wood is wet. cannot say all of that without saying this. If there is anyone here tonight who feels that tension that we talked about earlier. Not saying you're a mean, evil, nasty person who's waiting for the cops to knock in the door and come find you. That's not what I mean. But maybe, maybe there's something in your heart that you've not fully surrendered to him. Maybe there's something that you've covered up instead of fessing up and opening up. If there's anybody here that fits into that category, oh, what a beautiful time to just let go of it all in revelation of the grace that we've also talked about tonight and how you don't have to be afraid of anything, but you can approach the throne of grace in much anticipation, expecting grace and mercy that is available to you. Father in heaven, I just, I just thank you for your presence here tonight. I thank you for the joy that is found in this continuing miracle of Christmas. A miracle that doesn't stop December 25th, but keeps rolling throughout the rest of the year. A miracle that promises grace and mercy and forgiveness and a renewed and right relationship with the creator of this universe through that tiny child born in a manger that first Christmas day. Father, I kneel before you tonight on behalf of of everyone here and cry out that if there be anyone here who has anything that they need to let go of tonight may they just feel a sense of your mighty grace and mercy washing over them as they open up to you may they sense you in return opening up the floodgates of heaven and pouring out your blessing and your mercy and your grace upon them even now as we pray. May they feel no sense of regret. 
May they only feel a sense of release and joy and mercy. A sense of a renewed relationship with you. A sense of joy. Thank you, Father. Thank you so, so much. In Jesus' name, amen. with us tonight. Trust that uh, something you've heard tonight has, has filled you with a sense of hope. Something you have sung tonight has lifted your heart and your spirits. Before we dismiss, I would like to give you the opportunity to share if you have <laughs> phrases or prayer requests that, that you'd like us to help support you with or celebrate with you. Please feel free to share that with us at this time. Several months ago, <clears throat> I asked for prayers for my friend Emery Linky, who had had surgery, complications, uh, in a coma, just, I guess, everything he could think was wrong. Uh, Emery today is at home doing outpatient rehab. 
and coming along fine. And I know it's because of all of our prayers. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, continue to pray for my my cousin um, Abigail, who is going through chemotherapy now and wasn't able to join us for Christmas because her uh, white count wasn't <laughs> high enough for you know to be around others. So she's well, she's doing well, but it's just hard for anybody, but hard for a teenager too. I'd like to thank everybody for their prayers for our son Scott, who a year ago in last month had a massive stroke. He has made a 90 to 95 percent recovery, has returned to full time work, drives, has recovered his speech and swallowing ability, <laughs> and um, to all outward appearances has made a 100% recovery, and at the time that this occurred, it was doubtful that he would survive. So we give our thanks and praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's a powerful Amen. example of approaching the throne of grace boldly. Absolutely. I went down to Indianapolis to see my granddaddy. It's a month old. My son informed me that he quit smoking and drinking, both of them. So that was my Christmas present. I want to thank everybody for praying for me on my uh, long trip to see my brother and his family. Uh, <clears throat> boy, that was a long trip. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I came back okay. And, Praying for the rest of my family to go home. We had a big family get together at my brother's house in southeast Oklahoma. Uh, as I mentioned in uh, in uh, the service this morning, my brother is doing much better than expected. Uh, he and I were uh, driving down a country road in Oklahoma the day before yesterday, and um, he told me he realized uh, what the prognosis had been. Uh, I had. I knew that it was bad. His prognosis was bad. He knew it was bad. He's he's doing better than he should be doing. And he said it has to be the prayer. And he's right. I mean, we discussed that medication at length. We both understand things about that medication and how it's supposed to work. And it's not supposed to work this good. Um, uh, God is in the process of healing my brother. And I hope that he finishes that process. It's tough to talk about it before it's over, but I get so much support from the church I wanted you all to know, from all you people I wanted you to know. One more thing, I want to thank Dr. Rimel for helping Emily <laughs> and spending oh, yes. his time with her. Um, I'm happy that Emily felt that she could ask him to help her do that because of us being in a family with the church. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Our fr a lot of people in Plymouth know Tom and Linda Bloom and their daughter Lisa. Bunford died unexpectedly um, last Saturday night, and it was a shock and a great loss for them and for her husband, Glenn. And he doesn't have any family here. He's from Canada. So they need lots of prayers for Glenn Bunford and Linda and Tom Blue. something we don't do often here at the well. Um, I think it just seems fitting tonight. So um, you've heard the Lord's Prayer before, right? <laughs>
If you are comfortable doing so, I would invite you to take the hand of a neighbor or put your hand on their shoulder and let's just unite together in prayer. Let's share together in the Lord's Prayer. And I, I'll warn you ahead of time, I say the Lord's Prayer a bit slower uh, than some, so don't feel rushed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All praise, glory, and honor be given to you, our Father in heaven. Can we sing some more? Yeah, we'll sing some more. Oh. Oh. Hey. We're not going to be a stretch here. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Go in peace.